Okay, so look, it's, it's actually my, my, my pleasure to, um, to give, I guess, a, pres I guess a chairperson's uh, address. Um, I have wondered what to talk about this because um, I've given quite a few talks recently and I don't want people to get too bored at hearing my voice. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I thought I'd, I'd give, a, give a bit of a talk on, I guess, my real passion. So my real passions over the last 20 years in earth sciences have been really trying to, um, I guess, bring some of the expertise I, I got from my mentors when I was an undergraduate, when I was a PhD student, way back when the dinosaurs were on the earth, um, by looking at more recent rocks, by looking at Cenozoic tectonics in, in a very active parts of the world and applying them to older rock systems. And I've been extremely lucky during my career that the techniques and the technologies have been, have, have um, formed and been produced that have allowed, I think have really allowed those, those, our understanding of the more modern earth, more recent earth to be applied to the wonderful Proterozoic. I mean, I think the Proterozoic is the most ridiculously ignored part of the, the of earth history. And, and, and as fascinating as space and terrestrial geology is, uh, we know nothing about the Proterozoic. This is, the, this is 2 billion years of earth history. This is half the earth's history, really. And we know so little about it. I think we know much more about the Archean. Um, we had a lot more people working on it. And we certainly know a lot more about the Phanerozoic. And this two billion years of Earth history sort of gets forgotten about. Yet it's, it's what makes our planet distinct. Um, you know, I'd stick my neck out and say, we probably will find microbes on Mars one day. It's only a chemical reaction. Um, but we won't find complicated life. We won't find any, anything anything like what we see on this planet. And that's all happened in the last, in the Proterozoic. Um, we've got a world that early in the Proterozoic, you couldn't breathe the atmosphere. It, it, there was nothing floating around that you would recognize. Um, there wasn't, there weren't soils, there was nothing green. Um, and by the end of the Proterozoic, you'd be able to breathe the atmosphere. You'd be able to recognize creatures floating around that, okay, they don't look like what we see today, but they, they, they're, they're big creatures that you can see. Um, and, the, and there was life on land of some flavor. So almost everything that we know is what makes the Earth systems exist today um, occurred during the Proterozoic. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my adventures in the Proterozoic over the last X number of years. So there's a photo I don't show very often. This is me and me as a PhD student um, with a very strange looking beard because I was a pretentious PhD student. This is in Turkey. I, I, was, I did my PhD at the University of Edinburgh um, with some fantastic uh, supervisors, Alistair Robertson and John Dixon. Um, but I spent a year doing field work in Turkey. And when I say I spent a year doing field work, I probably actually only worked for about two months of that year, but I spent a year in Turkey. Uh, this is me in the last field season where I actually did work because I was scared because I had to get a thesis um, and I was on my own. Um, and that, that's me going, well, okay, let's work out what's going on in this, this incredibly complicated region. I'm gonna use this excuse to show some wonderful pictures of Southwest Turkey. Um, you're here in Southwest Turkey, you're inland from the sort of tourist resorts in Turkey and you're looking across at advancing thrush sheets. Those things, those mountains are thrush sheets. They're a Loch Ness units that have come from somewhere else and they're, they're moving towards you. They're a thing called the Lycian Naps. Um, and you are standing looking there across at a foreland basin that is, has flexed down and been filled up by all the, the eroded deposits from these thrush sheets. That was my PhD on these, these wonderful things called the Lycian Naps. A gorgeous area, that's actually in the far east of Turkey, looking across at Arabia, advancing into Europe. Um, that's looking down at the Euphrates in, the, in eastern Turkey. Um, I had some fantastic um, field assistants. These are the field seasons I didn't do too much work because I had some people there to go and explore the nightlife in, in, in Turkey. That's a woman called Sally Brown, who was another PhD student. Um, there's me looking at some quite complicated rocks. Uh, there's a field trip I ran for the University of St. Andrews when I was a PhD student, and that is my future wife, who I'm still married with. Yes, yes, we met as a PhD student and undergraduate. Very classic. Um, anyway, 25 years and a couple of kids later, um, 
that was the area I was working in, southwest Turkey. So the reason I'm doing this is because Turkey is part of the Alpine Himalayan chain, an incredibly complex amalgam of masses of different sutures, old oceans, small little continents that have rifted off something and moved and crashed into something else. It's got bits of oceanic crust that have been thrust up over everything. Everything green there is a bit of oceanic crust that is actually on the top of the mountains now, thrust up over everything else. Incredibly complicated. But all this happened in the last 100 million years. It's, it's still going on, really. Um, I've got a little video here now. Yes, it does have music. Um, it's only got music because it's a, it's a, a, a screenshot, a, a video taken from my computer, and I had... Um, I had Spotify playing at the time. So I didn't realize it recorded that as well. But anyway, this is just to show this whole area through the last sort of 100 million years has had all these different collisions and these bits and micro continents and ribbon continents that are all smashed up into each other, making this incredibly beautiful but complicated amalgam. And when I was doing my PhD, you could do, you could sort this out because these rocks have fossils in them, so you can you could date them, and 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 the dating was mainly done through microfossils. Um, it's in the Tethian region. The microfossil history has been done to death. It's fantastic. You can really subdivide the stratigraphy really well. Um, but during this, I can remember talking with my PhD supervisor at the time and just talking about the East African origin and and the big collisions that occurred as Gondwana got together and just how simple people thought they happened at the time. So I say there, there were lots of thrush sheets, lots of oceans, lots of sutures, all in a couple of hundred million years. So what about the Proterozoic? So, you know, we think of the Proterozoic as a long time ago. It is a long time ago. So if we think about, I don't know, I'll do, the, I'll do this with first years. So let's do meters for hundred, for billion years. One, two, three, four and a bit. So that's the Earth history. So out of that, that bit, that's Phanerozoic, that's where the fossils are. And then we've got one, two, that's the Proterozoic, a huge slab of time. So what about that? Surely we can say something a bit more useful than um, what people had been saying before. And there was quite a, quite a key paper came out um, in the late 80s, I think this is probably the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, by a guy called Bob Shackleton, and uh, he uh, said, where's the collision zone between East and West Gondwana? And again, if you're working in the Alpine Himalayan chain, you just thought this was a weird thing to ask, because why would you have a collision? You know, surely you'd have hundreds, or you'd have lots anyway, because that's what you have in the Phanerozoic, and certainly in the younger bit. And, and he came up and said, oh, he'd worked in Eastern Africa an awful lot, and he, he was a fantastic geologist, um, and he said, oh, this is the collisional zone between Eastern Gondwana, and you see there's Madagascar in there, there's India, um, there's Antarctica, and there's Western Gondwana there, Africa and South America and all that. And this is, this is the sort of reconstructions that people did, um, particularly in the 90s, and here's Dave Gray showing it in the 2000s, um, where, where Gondwana is divided into an East and a West bit, and there's a big zone in between where the two hit each other, game over. Um, simple. But why on earth would people look for one such a zone, right? You know, if plate tectonics were similar back at those two billion years of the Proterozoic, and there's not, you know, that's not that long ago as far as the Earth's concerned, um, why on earth would we be looking for one such a? Surely we should be looking for similar things that we see in the more recent Earth. Um, Surely it's too simple, it's too unrealistic. And of course, particularly when you take that sort of reconstruction of Gondwana and you look at areas that have been affected by orogenesis, have been heated up and been deformed in the Neoproterozoic. You can draw all these lines through both of those bits. So each one of these lines, um, it, it's sort of just, there's just as much evidence as that East African origin there going through East Africa and Arabia for saying that there were collision of different continents. And so it looks like a much more complicated amalgam. Um, and why not? You've got a long, long, long period of time to play with. Now, there were, there were good reasons for saying this at the time, but of course, we've moved on from a lot of that and a lot of those reasons have just vanished. 
So I guess when I first started my first postdoc, which was back in 1997, um, I was lucky enough to get a project working in Madagascar. So the middle of this thing. So this is, this is one of my favorite photos of Madagascar. So what do people think about Madagascar? What do people know about Madagascar? Um, well, okay, so these are all the places, the, the different field seasons I've had in Madagascar. I've been incredibly lucky to go many times with a lot of different collaborators from a lot of different parts of the world. And two wonderful PhD students were focusing on that and a, not a so ho-hum PhD student, Morgan, who was coming along for the ride and field assisting, helping out one of those. Um, so most people think Madagascar would look a bit like this, tropical, and, and it does on the coast, on the east coast, it looks like this. This is my long-term collaborator and love of my life, Theodore Razakamanana. Um, he is a fantastic individual. Um, I've been working with him since 1997. Um, and yes, some of the geology looks like that, but this honestly is the only outcrop I've ever been to on the coast of Madagascar that is actually reasonably well-preserved, not covered in rubbish. Um, most of the center of Madagascar looks like this. It's mountains, it's 2,000 meters high, it's the Alt Plateau, it's, it's quite cool. It, it's cold at night, snows on these things gets up over 3,000 meters. Um, quite barren, not much vegetation. People argue whether it was all covered in trees and all burnt down by the first inhabitants or not. It's, it's quite equivocal, actually. Again, Madagascar is one of these weird places like New Zealand that, that we've only got evidence for human habitation um, only at around about um, 800 AD is about the first evidence for human habitation. And it was first inhabited by Indonesians even though it's just off the coast of Africa. Weird. And the people still look like Indonesians, so a lot of them, the, the central plateau people. Um, just a few images of Madagascar. Again, the central part of Madagascar, people live in these sort of houses, look like gingerbread houses. Uh, animals down the bottom, people up the top, um, pulled around by bullock carts. There's people uh, having breakfast. These are, uh, these are beer bottles for breakfast, obviously you have beer for breakfast. When I first started going to Madagascar, the only English words you ever saw were three horses beer. Um, everything else was French. Um, and it's because the Dutch, uh, Amstel, uh, when the French still sort of had it as a colony, they bought the breweries in. So you still the only beer you can really get in Madagascar is THB, three horses beer. And this is the sort of field work we were doing. Um, this is one field season. This was with Chris Powell when I'd moved to Australia. and. Um, we were mapping this amazing area in the high plateau. So quite different. I, I thought, you know, people here often talk about mining and, and that. So this is mining Madagascan style. These are gold miners. Um, they are literally hitting a pegmatite with a wooden stake with a little bit of metal around the end of it, making holes. And then what do they do? They pan and they get visible gold. That's visible gold, everybody. Um, so incredibly tough, inc incredibly, um, well, incredibly rich area for artisanal uh, mining. And since I've been working in Madagascar, they've had a number of different sort of mineral rushes, including sapphire rushes. Almost every sapphire you buy today um, and for the last um, 15 years comes from Madagascar. It usually come, goes via Sri Lanka because um, they're legally exported to Sri Lanka. Then they go to Thailand where they get heat treated and then they make the international market. Uh, Virtually every sapphire is heat treated, uh, but they mainly come as alluvial sapphires from Madagascar. Um, and that's, that's a, a rush that's happened in the last 20 years. So I did quite a lot of work in Madagascar um, and I came up with a sort of a little model, nice different colors for different parts of Madagascar, um, but all had shared histories and they all had sort of tectonic boundaries between them. Now this was all well and good and who on earth would give a damn about Madagascar? So we started to think about, well, okay, so, so here's a Gondwana reconstruction again, just with a bit of color on it. Madagascar is sort of nestled in there in the armpit of Africa here between Somalia and uh, Kenya and Tanzania and India coming down through here. This is a, a so-called tight fit reconstruction that Colin Reeves constructed. I think it's a very good reconstruction actually. Um, and, and on, on it, all I've done is colored up is the parts of this bit of, of Gondwana that had either formed or had been deformed and metamorphosed in these sort of time periods between 800 and 600 or between 600 and 500 million years ago. So right into the Cambrian. 
that's there's Arabia there, Oman there, Saudi Arabia all through here, excuse me. And I've got bits of Antarctica in here. And all I've done on this is put in a gravity um, map here, which has helped to delineate some of the Antarctic terrains underneath the ice. Um, and obviously, we go into Australia over here, the Pinjara origin, the Lewin complex, Margaret River in there as well. So this was interesting. You sort of thought, OK, so we've been working in Madagascar. Well, let's see what's next to it. So let's have a look in southern India. So. Um, Again, I started work in, in Southern India in the 2000s, mainly when I came to Adelaide. I had a fantastic PhD student here, Diana Flavza, who's now Diana Zivak, who's a postdoc in the department here. We had a whole series of different um, honors students who'd worked out there. There's people like Jade Anderson, who works for Geoscience Australia now there, Will Teal um, there as well. Uh, we did lots of work in Southern, Madaga Southern India, <laughs> sorry. And we came up with these sort of, sorry, we came up with these different sort of terrains. And I'm going to take a little aside here for, for people. Most of you can fall asleep now. This is one of my favorite um, arrogant, well, little, uh, pretentious poems by William Blake, because I think it's all about geology. To see the world in a grain of sand, there's something about biology. To hold infinity in the palm of the hand. Um, and this is really detrital zircon chronology that he was, he was in the 18th century coming out with detrital zircon chronology. For those of you who don't know, that's what zircons look like. They never look like that, but that's what a zircon looks like. They more often look like this. These are detrital zircons. They're just grains of sand. You'll find them on Henley Beach. Um, you can image them in a scanning electron microscope, and they have pretty images like this with uh, cathode luminescence, zirconium silicate. But they also have a little bit of uranium and thorium. And that's what makes them so valuable, because uranium very complicated, eventually ends up with lead, and we can analyze it on a laser ice PMS just across from road there. We can also look at other things in the in zircon, such as hafnium, and we can say things about the origin of those grains of sand. Now, this is some data taken from Jared Lloyd's honors thesis back in the day, and I've only done this, so all this is doing is plotting this thing to do with hafnium isotopes, which really tell you about Oh, the nature of the melt that the zircon grew, whether that melt had just come straight out of the mantle or whether it had melted a bit of continental crust on its way to the surface, and then the age. So we might have a grain of sand there. That grain of sand there, there it is. That grain of sand um, is 200 million years old, 200 million years there, and it's up in what we call positive epsilon hafnium space, which means it formed pretty much by melting the mantle. Not much else happened to it. However, that one, we'll get another grain of sand. There we go, that one. There it is over there, much older, 2,300 million years old. And it's down here in the negative part of the plot. So it formed by melting a bit of continental crust. And that's really how those techniques work. Now, having said that, I'm only gonna really worry about the ages here. And this is, we're back in India. And we're, this is in the northern part of that little map of India. And we've got lots of old rocks, old grains of sand. That's all you need to know here. These are all Archean and, and early Paleo-Proterozoic. Whereas you go into the southern part of India, and these are all really metamorphosed rocks now. But those grains of sand in those metamorphosed sediments, there's a lot of young ones, a lot of ones that are about 1,000 or younger. There's the old ones. There's the young ones. So what that tells us is this southern part of India has a lot of sediments. Again, these are now really high grade metamorphic rocks. They're, they're crystalline, but they were once sediments. And we can see through that metamorphism and say that these were sediments that were deposited after those young ages. So in the Neo-Proterozoic, after a thousand million years ago, very different from northern, this northern part of peninsular India. And you can draw a line between them. Now we can go back into Madagascar and go, well, how does that fit into Madagascar? Well, OK, we can draw a line in Madagascar that seems to also separate old bits of Madagascar from younger bits of Madagascar. And we can look at all the sediments in those high mountains, and we can see that they also have quite a lot of these sort of younger, these green sediments in them. And it's very hard to see where these come from, these grains of sand. It's hard to go and say, well, where did they origin originate? They certainly don't originate from southern India. In this part of India, these rocks are very old. These are all Archean. 
So they, they don't come from India. They've got to come from somewhere else. And another place they might come from in Gondwana is from Eastern Africa, from Tanzania and Kenya. And if you look at rocks in Tanzania and Kenya, this is 600 of them. There's quite a lot that are around about the same sort of age as those grains of sand. So this is really noddy in a way. This is look, really just trying to fingerprint a rock by saying, where do those grains of sand come from? Where could they come from? It's not unique. Uh, this, is a, this is quite a, 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 a strange sort of reconstruction from a PhD student of mine, Sherry Armstead, um, who's got, there's Madagascar in there, there's that southern bit of India, there's the other rest of India, and there's Eastern Africa. And all she's got in here is colouring up where these similar age rocks are found and how different they are from, from southern India. And she's suggesting there was probably at one point um, an ocean between them. So we'd then argue this bit of this 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 bit of Madagascar had been part of Africa, but then by the Neoproterozoic, it was separated from Africa by an ocean. It had been rifted off. We know that because there's all these arc rocks in in Madagascar. And that's really cool because that means central Madagascar is actually an old continent. Um, and I've you know I never thought when I was a kid growing up I never thought I'd discover a continent, and we did discover a continent. Um, and we proposed this in 2005. We proposed that throughout this area, there was an ancient continent um, sandwiched between India and, and Africa that separate that goes through central Madagascar, southern, southern India, central Madagascar, Somalia, and right up into Yemen and Saudi Arabia. You found a continent, you've got to call it something. Um, and um, by complete inspiration, um, we called it uh, Azania. So Azania is where Tanzania gets its name from. And that root of that word comes from a book that is anonymous, which is somewhere around about 100 AD. And it's got the wonderful title of the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Um, it exists, it's a real book, and it was actually a nav it's what the Greeks knew about the Indian Ocean. It's a sort of a navigator's guide to the Indian Ocean by um, sort of uh, Alexandrian Greeks. And Azania was what they, this coast was called in that. Now, it sounds as though I'm really well educated to know that. Obviously, I've read this book cover to cover in, in the original Greek. Um, if you read The Lonely Planet of Tanzania, right at the start, it mentions this, and that's where I got this from. Um, but, but I have since found this book um, and, and, and looked at the translations of it, and this was a sort of a a map that came out from that. It was also used in a novel by Evelyn Waugh in the 30s as a fictional island off the east coast of Africa, and that also seemed um, quite appropriate. So he had an Zanian empire. Uh, I don't usually mention what the title of the book was called. The book was called Black Mischief, which is not a very PC title, but I quite like this sort of, uh, this sort of fictional island. So those of you who may have been in Africa in the, uh, particularly Southern Africa in the 1970s or 80s, we know Azania is also quite a politically charged term, but um, we think this has a, a much better history. So Azania is this, this continent that goes up into Arabia. So um, we went up to Arabia to look and we went into Ethiopia as well to try and look at how this whole sort of area fits together. I'm just gonna show a few images from, from Arabia um, in the early 2000s, late, late, late to late noughties and the early 2010s, we had some projects. There's John Foden, there's Galen Halverson, who was here. There's a few people you may know, Grant Cox, uh, David Nettle, who's in Geoscience, sorry, David Nettle, who's in Santos, and Chris Lewis, who's in Geoscience Australia there as honours students um, in Saudi Arabia. There's Arabia. You can simplify Arabia into these, these areas that where they're exposed. Um, this is the Saudi Arabian shield. So this is just a total magnetic um, intensity image. And over here, I've got, uh, got Oman with a whole lot of petroleum fields. The petroleum in Oman actually comes from the Neoproterozoic. It's, it's for the MacArthur Basin. It was the oldest petroleum in the planet. Um, and I've put that there because throughout the Neoproterozoic, um, particularly the later Neoproterozoic, nothing happens in, a, in Oman. It's, it's a passive margin. It's as stable as anything. It's completely opposite in Saudi Arabia. You have all these different terrains. 
And if you look at some of these terrains, and this is in getting on towards the center of Saudi Arabia, very highly deformed. These are Neoproterozoic rocks. These are, these, these are, the thing didn't come, there we go. This is a basin, 620 to 615 million years. These are Ediacaran rocks. They're highly deformed. They're, very, they're eroding off an arc at the time. And they are superimposed on them. There are these little rift basins, which are extremely beautiful outcrops um, of sediments sitting in top in, in them, again, in the late part of the Ediacaran. And in them, we even find Ediacaran fossils. So when you look at this area, again, this is incredibly tectonically active in the Ediacaran towards the Cambrian, whereas this part here in Oman is not tectonically active at all. It's a nice big passive margin, lots of sediments, lots of carbonates. Tectonically, nothing's happening at all. Um, so we started to put all this together and realize that we had um, crust sort of younging arcs growing east in Arabia, whereas in Oman, we had older arcs that then switched off and this whole margin of, in, of Neoproterozoic India became a passive margin at the time. So that was really taking that Azanian story up into Arabia and looking at how, the comp if you like, from a sort of a Tethian perspective, how this region may have evolved, this whole region may have evolved. Um, I guess over the 2000s and the 2010s, uh, again, I was lucky enough to supervise some fantastic students and projects in all of these different areas, in lots of these sort of red zones from Morgan working in Oman and Ethiopia here, Western Ethiopia here, to Brandon Alessio working down here in Zambia, in the Zambezi belt, to Ben McGee here, I've missed his area, he was in Brazil, that's my colleague Ricardo Trindaji from Sao Paulo and Sherry Armstead here who worked in, in Madagascar. Uh, also Donnelly Archibald, who I've missed a picture of, also worked in Madagascar. That's because I couldn't find a decent one of Donnelly. Now we did all this because the whole purpose of this really was to try and reconstruct these origins, to try and put them into a plate tectonic context. And that led to this sort of model that we produced a couple of years ago last year, um, where we put these data, these, these observations, I suppose, these interpretations of these data into a, a full plate reconstruction. Um, I'm just gonna let it get back to something that's back in this time zone. So here we are, we're now in the Ediacaran. So I'll click it, oops, sorry, missed the button. Oh, come on, did I forward it? Yes, let's take it to somewhere back where you want it to be. Let's just take it to there. So we're back in the, well, we're back in the Tonian here, going into the Cryogenian, bring it to catch up on itself. There we go, is it pause? No, come on, pause. It's not gonna pause. There we go, that'll do. That's the Ediacaran. Um, again, these are impossible to follow. So Morgan asked me not to put this reconstruction in because you can't ever follow anything. Um, Adelaide's got a little, ass, little diamond in there, so we can at least see where else bits of South Australia is. The whole area I've been talking about is actually all in here. This is Madagascar, this is Azania. Um, it's colli just colliding with East Africa, but India hasn't collided in with it yet. This is part of Arabia. All these oceans in Brazil and in Africa and in Northern Africa are closing, forming Gondwana. And we're also colliding India on the west, northwest and west coast of, of, of Australia. India is then going to go and smash into this bit of Antarctica, causing quite a big origin in Antarctica at the time. Um, I've worked many times, lots of times with paleo magicians. Um, the, the answer isn't in paleomagnetics. So paleomagnetics give you a little hints of what's going on. The answer's in the geology. Um, it's where the evidence for what's happened in the past world is. So anyway, we'll go beyond that. Nearly done, don't worry. Um, so the next step, so if you, can, if you can come up with models for what the earth was like, the plate tectonics of the earth was like back to a billion years. I guess the next step is, okay, so what did that plate tectonics do to the earth? 
So today, the Earth is sort of, you know, our Earth system is dominated with plate tectonics. Gases are put into the atmosphere because of plate tectonics. Erosion is occurring on mountains that are there because of plate tectonics. We can look at the modern Earth today and we can do models about how much erosion is going on, how much erosion of silicates is happening, and we can say how much carbon dioxide is being fixed by this weathering that's happening on these mountains. And that's what these sort of figures are trying to do. They're saying, oh, look, that's what the world looks like in terms of rock types. I'm not quite sure what a shields rock is, but I, I suspect that. But anyway, they're just dividing the world into all these different rock types, super simplified. And then they're saying which bits are high, which bits are low, where's it raining, where's it not raining, um, how much weathering is going on, how much carbon dioxide is being locked up in that by that weathering. But the biggest control on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the weathering of rocks. And we can even, you know, pretend to play that into the future to see what happens if we increase um, increase temperature, increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. People are trying to do this and have done this reasonably successfully in deepish time. So this is um, Eve Goddery's model from 2017, looking at the Carboniferous to Permian, the, the Hallett Cove glaciation, if you like, the Gondwana-eyed glaciation. And they are arguing that because of mountain belts that were forming during the Briskin orogeny, in this model, they're, they're arguing that that was one of the biggest controls on temperature and us going into a cold period at the time. There are other arguments for this, but this was their, their argument. Doing exactly the same things as we're doing in the modern Earth. There are, there are tens of papers, usually in very high profile journals, such as Science and Nature over the last five years, that have been suggesting that the same things happen in, the, in deeper time. But at the moment, we don't have models that we can actually test these. It's completely unscientific, really. They're completely untestable. They're, they're hypotheses. Here we have frameworks we can test these hypotheses. When we go back into deeper time, we are only just developing the frameworks where we can start to test these. And that's wonderful for looking at things like the carbon cycle and looking for nutrient supply or erosion of things. But of course, when we get back into deeper time, we have other things to play with. And we can think about, well, what's happening to, to what, you know, why do we have oxygen kicking around? So oxygen, of course, is linked to photosynthesis. So why do we have photosynthetic creatures where, where, where they're around. Um, I really like this paper by Chris Reinhardt in 2016 because it's an incredibly simple paper. Um, what he, what, what he and his co-authors have done here is they've just said, okay, let's not do anything to geography. Let's just look at um, where dissolved oxygen is in the surface waters when we just dial back the amount of oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. So PAL is present atmospheric level. So this is 10% oxygen in, of present atmospheric levels. And this is looking at where oxygen is dissolved in surface marine waters. And this looks just like it does today. Cold waters have more oxygen dissolved in it than warm waters. When you get back to levels of oxygen that are much lower, and this is more like the proteasome, this is still, this is possibly quite high for the Proterozoic actually, you have a completely different pattern. And where you have oxygen in surface waters is where you have life. So it's fundamentally different. And that's because it's where photosynthetic creatures are. So it's where you're producing that oxygen, it stays there. It's not because of the atmosphere controlling it. There's not much oxygen in the, at in the atmosphere. So that means oxygen in those water is there because of life and life is there because the nutrients are there for it. So you have a whole, you have a very tectonic control on the distribution of oxygen in waters. It comes down to plate tectonics. So that I think is one of the biggest reasons to look at these things. And that is what we're doing now, really looking at proterozoic basins in Australia. We have a very big project with some fantastic students um, working in Northern Australia in the so-called Greater MacArthur Basin, which is really every sediment that's meso and paleo proterozoic in, in, in Northern Australia from the Kimberley right over to sort of Mount Isa and beyond, and certainly all through central North, um, Northern Australia. And again, when you start playing with reconstructions, you see that here's Northern Australia upside down. Um, that's North China right next to it, very much the same sort of geology through there. So the, these, these basins were huge. Um, 
and probably very large flooded platforms to, to the supercontinent that was around at the time. And we're also doing this in the Neo Proterozoic and the Centralian and Adelaide Superbasins. And Jared has done some fantastic work in the Adelaide Superbasin here. And we've just had a project um, funded that uh, Stefan Lur is, is, is sort of leading with Uri Farkash on, on the Centralian Superbasin, the officer Mardius and Georgina particularly. Um, and as I say, uh, a part of this is to really try and investigate these incredible sequences. So this is this is a plane view in Arkarula with Doug Sprigg flying the plane, looking right over to um, Mount Benython in the Gamma Ranges there, of the vast Neoproterozoic sequence there that so little has been done on for so many years. Um, I guess my research, I had a, a quite a fundamental moment, I suppose, with my research group about uh, two years ago when we were looking at a paper, a very interesting paper looking in South China where there's been an awful lot of work done recently. And we had to look at this paper a number of times to realize the, diff the stratigraphy between the two neoproterozoic glaciations in these key sections was 20 meters. Um, it's about 10 kilometers up here. Uh, and yet, I don't think anyone's worked on that section there for a long, long time. Um, so anyway, just to finish off, I want to acknowledge, um, I guess, my mentors over these years, because people don't very often. Um, and I've tried to give a bit of an overview, I guess, of the arc of where my research has been going over, over 25 years. Um, it started off with uh, colleagues of mine. So this is a woman called Tiffany Barry, who works in Leicester University. I went to Spitsbergen with her when we were both 18 years old. Um, and we both met in Spitsbergen and we were the two high school students who carried on in geology ever since. This is my PhD supervisor, Alistair Robertson, who's the best comb over in geology. Um, he's a fantastic man, a very, uh, a very unique individual, fantastic geologist. Uh, this was my second supervisor, John Dixon, who unfortunately died a few years ago. A, a really lovely guy, a fantastic man, does look like Gandalf. Brian Winley here, who I worked with for many years. Um, this gentleman here you can't really see is John Cosgrove. He taught me structural geology in Imperial College. A gorgeous man and um, somebody who actually used to, who went to university with half the members of Queen, so he was God. <laughs> Um, and he has some stories. Shabani Patranus Deb from um, Calcutta, brilliant sedimentologist, love her to bits. Peter Kaywood, who um, looked after me in Adelaide, in, in Perth, and has ever since. Theodore, best man in the world. John Foden, well, he's okay. Richard Hillis um, and Renata Schmidt um, in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And then a few people here, Uri and Morgan, who I've been working with many times, and these are all the PhD students I've been lucky enough to be involved with. So thank you all those people, um, they're amazing. So I, I came up when I was looking at trying to find a picture of Alistair um, that didn't look too ridiculous today. Um, I came up with this quote he, he did by awarding a prize from the Joel Soccer London in 2015. I love this. Um, and actually uh, this, this I, I do think um, is really a, a thing that most academics should go with or most geologists should go with. Don't stick with your favorite ology, but go for geological problem solving wherever it takes you. Train your students, especially PhD students, to be more broadly based than you are and position yourself through collaboration in the mainstream of geoscience. A trunk stream is more powerful than a tributary. Thanks for your attention. I hope I didn't go on too long.